So a Friday rally snapped a three-day losing streak. The Sensex and the Nifty ended the week in the green. IT bigwigs delivered with Q3 earnings. But what about the others? Big numbers lined up this weekend and the budget is just around the corner. What should you make of all the noise surrounding capital gains tax and all that glitters is indeed gold. We analyze all of this and more in Editor's Roundtable. Thanks so much for tuning in. I have all the editors here with me. Folks, it was a tricky week, right? I mean, we tested the 100 DMA, we tested the December lows. Thankfully, we held on to it. But hmm. by and large, the market texture has sort of weakened a bit. I just have to say that we are, this is just week two of 2023, right? <laughs> yeah. And it already feels like, we feel jaded. I mean, at least I feel jaded, right? <laughs> and, and just 10 days and there is 10,000 crores of selling by the FIs. That's a big yeah. number for, for the start of the year. Yeah. To see 10,000 crores of selling from the FIs, that's a big number. So, I think they, at least they've started the year on a, on a bad note for India. What would be the reasons? They're, they're moving yeah. to China or some other countries, but at least they've sold very aggressively in the Indian markets in the first 10 days. You know, in cricketing uh, parlance, I would say that the bowlers are the bears. You know, they're bowling yorker to yorker. Unfortunately, when we're going to around 17,750, it seems they're mistiming that yorker. <laughs> and the bulls are smashing it out of the park. How many times have so we gone? So the Kohli that's coming in at 17,750? At 750 <laughs> and smashing it because, you know, not getting the yorker right and that's why it's, it's resulting in a full toss. I don't know, in the last, what, uh, 20 days, we must have gone there at least four, so five for times. this week, Nigel, we started this week at 18,000. We ended this week at 18,000. Yeah. But in that, every day virtually would have seen a 200, 300 point of rally few on hot, the Nifty. So that's the kind of volatility which has been, which has been there Bet for the market. Between that, few heart attacks, right? I mean, <laughs> up and down and... Uh, <laughs> You know, so uh, what you said, right, Nimesh, which is the, where is the flow going? And I think the data shows that flows are actually heading out to some of the big underperforming yeah. markets of 2022. I put this out earlier and, uh, you know, the so two tables will come up on your screen. One is returns year to date and the second is flows year to date. Returns compared to other markets in the region and flows also compared to the same markets around the region. And I think it's very clear. So the returns are in dollar terms. India is up 1% dollar terms year to date. Uh, and uh, look at the other markets, they are up much more. Uh, the, uh, screen, the graphic on your screen is flows. India has seen $1.4 billion of outflows and other markets have seen, you know, uh, from $500 million all the way to $2.5 billion. So the delta, the difference between what India has done in terms of returns this year and flows this year, when I say this year, it's two weeks, right? I mean, so but it's year to date. Uh, uh, so numbers are what they are and it's very stark. So I think as all of us uh, were saying, that uh, there is a little bit of reallocation, tactical, short term, whatever it is, but it is happening. Uh, it has happened so far. The question is, will it continue to happen? Uh, and I think that is, a, that, that is something we'll only be wiser about in hindsight. If, you, if uh, the feedback that one gets talking to uh, people who invest here, uh, both, just here and around the world as well, is that perhaps that this has got a little bit more to go before uh, you, know, you, you kind of normalize things a little bit. Just quick, quickly, levels really, I mean, I think the... Uh, that number around 18,000, the precise uh, number is 17, uh, 780, 17,774 or so. That is a December low. It got broken once briefly intraday. We've come back above it. But I think that 17,800, just that's the round number to watch out for. And it's crucial that the nifty kind of holds on to that. Otherwise, I mean, you're looking at the next big support is, uh, you know, a retracement from the, the June lows of 15,183 to the all-time high. And that number is at about 17,500. So... If, if this goes, you, you, you know, technically a 300-point downside kind of starts to open up. On the bank nifty, again, I mean, the numbers to uh, focus on is the bank nifty never broke the December low, so that kind of becomes a support. For both the nifty and the bank nifty, the 20-day moving averages, respectively, are, I think, the uh, not change, uh, trend changer, but I think it will add more confidence to the bulls. It's not very far away for both. One or two more days, a positive days, like what we had on Friday, can result in that. Uh, next week, in terms of queues, I mean, you've got plenty of earnings. Uh, so we really get into the thick of the earnings season, starting, with, of course, uh, today on Friday with Wipro and over the weekend, and then, of course, next week uh, as well. Uh, and, of course, I mean, you know, global queues, uh, always important to track. Two weeks away from the budget, I also looked at returns two weeks uh, before the budget, and there is no clear trend. We'll talk more about that when we come back next week. Uh, so I think uh, we've got our hands full, especially with earnings and what's happening in the market itself. Nimesh, what are you picking up? So, you know, Prashant spoke about the big 10,000 crore of selling from the FIs, but the big chatter in the dealing rooms was that a leading hedge fund was a, was unwinding the India positions. 
uh, whether it's already done with, whether it's done 70 percent, uh, only time will tell. But the feedback is uh, they've sold one of most of the large large cap stocks in the last you know t t last 10 days of, of January. So that's that's the overall feedback as far as who's been selling in the Indian markets. Uh, looks like some of the large cap names are a little oversold, so that can be a bit of a support to the bulls. But I guess 17800 is what we need to watch out for this week. Every day the bulls have defended 17800 on the downside. Whether that will be the case next week, uh, I guess some earnings can be a bit of a support uh, to, the, to the bulls in, in that levels. I guess, you know, for the next few days, a few weeks, uh, the earnings and the pre-budget pre expectations will be the big, you know, talking point and that will dominate the mind space uh, for the investors as well. But I guess, uh, you know, even on the first, when we did the first, first uh, series, uh, you know, at the start of the year, I had said about some large blocks which are pending. The Kotak block didn't happen, but even this week you saw two large blocks in Paytm, despite the fact that there is there is further sell, further you know uh, sell off expected, uh, uh, so th still then there was there was a there was a bit of demand there, and we saw yesterday Shriram uh, Shriram uh, you know finance block got done, despite the fact that there is Piramalu who is holding back, and even they can sell further. So despite that, there is there has been large blocks happening. So that that's that's something to take out take away with. But the fact is there is a large sell off from the FIS, and looks like one of the leading uh, hedge fund was unwinding into positions. Only time will tell whether they are done with. And that can be a bit of a support if the bulls wants to take that, that, that part and the fact that some large caps are a little oversold. All right. Uh, you know, Limesh, thanks very much for that. We are going to focus on uh, uh, stuff you can touch and feel. Steel, <laughs> gold. That's the focus today. <laughs> Sorry, is going to get to gold, but before that, Nigel, you're looking at steel, right? Well, yeah, that's right. You guys are talking about the markets being volatile. Yeah. I'll tell you what's been doing well, the metal index. So let's go across to the big wall and tell you more about that. So the metal index, you know, in the last couple of months or so, the Nifty is more or less unmoved, but the metal index is up close to around 15%. Big outperformance out there. The China unlock is playing out, and there's a double bazooka that's playing out out there. One is the Chinese economy is unlocking, so obviously a more amount of steel, more amount of metal is used. And the second factor is the domestic steel market was plagued because there was an export duty that was levied. That got pulled off in November itself. So good couple of tailwinds did come in for the industry. Let's run you through five big points that have been helping the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the steel industry in particular. The Chinese push. Well, there were two factors out there that was ailing the Chinese market. One was the property market. The second factor was there was no mobilization. People were stuck at home. Now, both of them are being addressed, too, so the Chinese government and the Chinese authorities are focusing on, focusing on this. So, good news out there. Second factor is the Chinese steel prices. Remember the HRC prices? Well, they corrected from around $860 at the start of uh, 2022 all the way to around $500 odd. But with this unlock theme playing out, well, the pricing is currently at around $620, $630 per tonne. So, that's giving you a case that domestic prices will get some kind of support. Moving to the domestic prices itself, in India, well, the steel prices were at a premium in comparison to Chinese steel prices. That is, if you import steel from China, well, it was coming at a cheaper rate. Well, that's quickly turned around because from an 8,000 rupee premium, the Indian steel makers, they went ahead and they cut prices, while the Chinese players, they increased prices. Suddenly, the thing, the entire ratio has flipped around and now you have the Chinese steel, if you import it, it's coming at a premium in comparison to domestic steel prices. A couple of brokerages like, uh, you know, JP Morgan as well as Boffa ML, they are expecting price increases of two to 3,000 in the next few months. Next up, I know prices. They've been on a tear, up close to around 50% from the lows that we recently saw. Remember, if I know prices move up, it gives a bit of a base for steel uh, companies as well. And it's advantage India, because India gets most of, you know, the fairest guys, they get most of their iron from domestic sources. Domestic iron is at a discount in comparison to imported uh, uh, iron that comes in there. And also keep in mind that if iron prices move up, then steel prices, they get a base. And in that context, India is relatively better placed. F finally, demand. Demand's been good. That price increase that's been taken at the start of January, it's been lapped up by consumers, so good news out there. Restocking is taking place. First, the consumers were saying, no, let's not buy, steel prices will fall. Now they're loading up yet again. And also, in the coming quarter, you'll have export volumes that will pick up. Finally, not uh, steel and metals is not really about valuations, but we need to focus on that. It's more about, about momentum investing. And that's why we've seen these stocks run up. But more or less, on a price to book value, it's pretty much in line with uh, what they've been trading at. So that's about the metal and the ferrous space. But guys, you know, Sonia, uh, everyone doesn't track steel, right? People want to look at gold, suddenly that's making a comeback. Tell us more about that. You have been tracking that space. In fact, history suggests that gold's been a decent performer as well. I hope you guys have bought some gold I for have. yourselves, for your wives. My little girl at home. <laughs> Two and a half Whenever percent they tell you to buy gold, you go ahead and do it. Absolutely. There's a big degree of outperformance <laughs> over there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, you know, as they say, all that glitters is gold indeed. And this week, the big headline really 
was MCX Gold hitting an all-time high. It hit a high of 56,000 rupees. Now, that's a gain of 17.5% in the last one year alone. In fact, international prices hit $1,900 an ounce as well. That's a gain of almost 16% from the September lows. That's on international gold prices uh, that will come up for you in just a bit. Now, the question we're asking today is, with an expectation of a single-digit return in equities this year, or maybe not even that, is it better to move to alternate asset classes like gold? Will there be a continued up move over there? Now, uh, what I did is I tried to assess the returns of gold compared to the Sensex for 1, 5, 10 and 15 years. And I noticed that for a majority part of the last 15 years, gold has seen a significant outperformance. Look at that. In the one year, last one year, 13.9% up move in gold, while Sensex barely 4.5%. In 10 years, is the only one where gold has not outperformed. In 5 years, 13 and a half and 12 and a half. And look at 15 years. If 15 years back you had bought gold, your compounded growth rate would have been almost 12% compared to just 7.6% for the Sensex. Now, of course, we do know why gold is rallying. A couple of key factors here. There's expectations of a mild global recession. There's a further weakening of the dollar. There's geopolitical flare-ups. So, you know, there's an energy crisis in Europe because of which perhaps people are moving their investments to safe haven like gold. In, the Ch in China, there's a reopening trade, so perhaps consumption of gold would go up there and hence gold prices are looking good. But the question we're asking now is, does gold do well in a recession? And yes, it does. In five out of the last seven recessions, gold has actually um, given positive returns. So we pulled out the data for you. Just look at that. Way back from December of 1973, gold gave you a 66% return in that recession compared to the Dow, which was down about 10%, and so on and so forth. Just take a look at 2001, gold gave you a 4% return, while the Dow was down about 8.2%. And finally, in March of 2020 to April 2022, gold gave you a 20% return. Of course, the Dow also had a commensurate increase over there. So that's the big takeaway, right? Um, gold did well in five out of the last seven recessions. Just quickly on to what brokerages are forecasting. JP Morgan has said that oil and gold will drive the commodity returns in 2023 and they forecasted gold prices at $1860 an ounce. It's already surpassed that level. But there is one risk. The downside risk is if there is a soft landing scenario. So I want to in fact toss this question to our guest Ajay Srivastava who's joining in of Dimensions Consulting. Um, Ajay, you know, this is something that is right down your alley. I think for the last uh, maybe three or four months, you've been saying that equities is not the place to be. There are other asset classes, alternate asset classes that you should look at. Does gold top your list? Of course it does. <clears throat> you already gave it all the statistics possible. <laughs> your mother told you, your grandmother told you, and they were very wise investors at this point of time. And it's brilliant that you put up this analysis because it tells people that there is more to investment than the stock market. There's more to investment than the headlines. Simple, straightforward investment strategy, gold. And the reason gold is good is two things are happening. Supply doesn't go up dramatically. But all the central banks, whether it's India, whether it's China, whether it's Europe now, they all are stocking up gold. So, you know, not only there is a consumer demand, there is a huge demand from central banks to shore up the gold reserve. And quite obviously, as arithmetic goes, when the reserves go up, the proportion of gold they need to maintain has to also go up, and therefore they need to buy gold. So gold will remain an absolute gold standard for investment for the three reasons central banks want it. It's li most liquid of the all, and when the market hits the real bad patch, it's gold which counts in the end. So I would certainly say gold will remain, should remain a decent part of I'm not saying put everything in gold, but should remain a decent part of a portfolio. And I think I heard you saying jewelry. Don't even count that as an investment. Man, that's an expense. Book it. <laughs> Sovereign gold bonds. Yeah, I know. I know what you're getting to. <laughs> uh, Ajay, so, so exactly that point. And just to complete that loop on gold, what is the best way to own it? I mean, gold uh, in what form? Sovereign bonds or something I think, else? ETF. I think... I think I would say sovereign gold bonds is good, but okay. I would still prefer physical gold to hold with us okay. because government is government at the end of the day. Physical gold I would like to keep. And you know, so some of the coins which are coming up in the, the Hong Kong coin and the other stuff is a premium to the market. You can't get them if you want a large quantity. So I would say bars, physical gold in bars and coins would be the right I'm way to do it. Put part of it in the 2.5% because that's subject right. to government can do what it wants, the rate what it wants. So physical gold over paper gold any day. Okay, with that, let's take a short commercial break on Editor's Roundtable. We'll be back in a bit.